Okay, uh, well, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to this last uh, of the Open Simons Lectures for this, for this semester. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, uh, it's, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Ignacio Sirac, uh, who most of you know is the co-organizer of this uh, special semester on, on uh, quantum Hamiltonian complexity. Um, Many of you also probably know you are in for a special treat. Uh, um, Ignacio is one of the very uh, few people who is equally uh, fluent talking to experimental AMO physicists as he is to theoretical condensed matter physicists. And as many of you have discovered, uh, as he is to talk in talking to <coughs> theoretical computer scientists. So uh, Ignacio is the currently the director of the Max Planck Institute in Gauteng, uh, uh, Germany, and uh, uh, he, uh, he's responsible for just a, a, a remarkable number of innovations, uh, uh, starting with his proposal for iron trap quantum computing, which, which really got uh, some of the experimental work off the ground, uh, uh, also his work on, on, uh, on optical lattices, and then, of course, on, on the theoretical uh, side in condensed matter physics, he's, he's done this um, remarkable range of work, uh, you know, on on PEPs and renormalization groups and so on, um, and um, I, I should say I should say that um, uh, Ignacio is a you know I'm I'm sure you some some of you who have interacted with him might not have realized exactly how distinguished he is. He's received a number of awards, including including the Benjamin Franklin Medal in 2010 and the Wolf Prize last year which um, people who know more about this than I do uh, say is, the, is, um, is, is um, well correlated with people who eventually want to win a Nobel Prize. So, um, so, um, so I should say that his, uh, you know, probably his, his level of distinction is only, only surpassed by his, uh, his humility and his, uh, his enthusiasm in, in going for a beer after, after work in the evening. So, uh, no, okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you a lot, Mish, for this very kind introduction. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here. And so first of all, I would like to, to thank the, the Simon Center for hosting uh, not only me, but also many people coming from uh, uh, physics background and computer science background to participate in the program called Quantum Hamiltonian complexity that it's finishing next week or in a couple of weeks from now. And second, I would also like to thank the Miller Institute for Basic, uh, the basic Research in Science for uh, sponsoring my stay here. And so I was asked already many, many uh, uh, months ago to give a, a kind of a popular talk about the content of this program, Quantum Hamiltonian Complexity, that took, took part, or that is taking part in, in this institute at this moment. So this is going to be very, uh, very low level. So I'm sorry because I see that some of the participants of the workshop are here. So for them, of course, this would be, uh, uh, be embarrassing for me to tell in front of them something like that. <laughs> but anyway, so I, have, I, have, I, have, I want to explain uh, what are the motivations? So why are we having this workshop? And so what are the questions that we're trying to address? And, and, and so what do we know? What's, what, what is known? What's not known? And it would be very hand waving. And so only at the end, I think that I will go into a little bit of detail and I'll introduce maybe some concepts and some formulas and, and so on. But I hope that the people are not specialized, uh, can follow all, 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 the, all, the, all the talk. And, and uh, I also assume that you have no idea about quantum mechanics. I will use a very, a very kind of hand waving wave of, of uh, talking about quantum mechanics. So again, I have to apologize in front of the people who are experts in quantum mechanics because some of the things that I'm going to say, I mean, that's not really rigorous, but it's a way of explaining if I had to tell to somebody who has not had this experience of quantum mechanics before. So uh, uh, so the, in, the, in the title, uh, I wrote uh, quantum many body system, but also the word of simulate. And so what I mean is, is something that is sometimes puzzling people like, like me and some other people is that now you want to uh, construct a, a plane or you want to make a big building, you can do it basically on your computer. Okay? So you can test whether the plane or most parts of the plane will fly just by writing a program with computer finite elements, testing everything, and, and, and then you have to do a couple of experiments just to, to check a couple of things. But you can basically simulate so how this plane with some given profile, etc., etc., will behave in a, in a computer. 
don't have to test it. You don't have to, 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 to I mean, build it and see if it flies or not. I mean, you can, you, can, you can do it in your computer. And the same thing with a building. However, there are some materials like this one that is here, which is uh, very, very small. It's maybe I mean, two centimeters uh, long. And that, that uh, you, it's a superconducting material that you put in, other, in, on, in, in a current in a magnetic field, and then it <coughs> levitates. And we don't know how to describe this material here. And not only that, I can give you other materials which are composed of only hundred or thousand of atoms, and we don't know how to describe. We don't know how to how to predict what are the physical properties. We don't know if it will levitate or will not levitate in the presence of a magnetic field, or if it will be conductor or not conductor, or if its conductor is a good conductor, superconductor, or not superconductor. So it's uh, fascinating the fact that we can simulate macroscopic things, things that are made out of many, many, many atoms, and, uh, and uh, whereas uh, things that are microscopic, that very few components, we cannot, we cannot simulate and have no idea how to do that. And so why, what I want to explain here is why this is so difficult, and so some ways of, of what I mean also by difficult, and also to some ways around. So what are people trying to do in order to uh, attack these problems? Because some of them are very relevant. So for example, this material here, this superconducting material, it would, would understand, so why is it superconductor? And we'd be able to increase the temperature at which it becomes superconductor. Then this would have a, it would be a, a revolution in, in, in technology. So we could have uh, trains, I don't know, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that uh, levitate and then have less friction, or we could store electricity during night, just going around without losses. And, uh, and then use it during the day, so it will have a very big impact. But we, don't, we cannot do that, and one of the reasons is because we don't know how to describe these materials. Anyway, so, so in, I'm a physicist, and uh, so with typically when you have a physical system, like the material that I had before, what we do is to do models of that. So for example, you have a, a, a piece of material, or you have, uh, I don't know, uh, like in the experiments here in, in, in Berkeley, in the physics department, they have atoms that are uh, levitating in space and they are moving and they want to describe what are the physics or you have a, a molecule and you want to describe what is the reaction what will be the product of a molecule or even from a more fundamental point of view you have something like the standard model these are uh, some physical um, you want to describe some physical systems and so typically you're interested in knowing some properties of all of them so for example what are the microscopic properties so as I mentioned before is this conducting not conducting is this, are these particles moving freely or they will get stuck and they cannot go to each other, or is there a physical reaction here, and can you have products or not? You can also start, want to study things like stability. So, I mean, if we touch this material, will it break down, or will something happen with that? We'd like to know also type of excitations, so the, the probability of certain events, so the physical reaction occurs, or that uh, I mean, in, in, in the Higgs boson is produced, etc., etc. So we have some physical systems, and at the end, we'd like to make some predictions with that. And in order to do that, what we do is to create models. So we, we take, for example, into each of those physical systems, and we put them on a lattice. For instance, uh, we have a material. The material is composed of atoms, which are in a periodic structure. And so they have already a lattice structure. And if we study the motion of the electrons on this lattice, then we have a lattice. So we have some lattice sites. And we model the electrons like being in one position and jumping to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Or if these electrons, for example, uh, we're interested not in the electrical properties, not whether the electrons move there, but in the magnetic properties. As you know, the electrons have a spin, so which is responsible, like a small magnet, which is responsible for the magnetic properties. So we may be interested now in the, whether this is a magnet or it's not a magnet. So then we just write a lattice, make a model of lattices in which we put the magnet at each of the sides, and then we study this, this model here. Or the same thing in optical lattice, the same thing with chemistry. So you also model, you also I mean, discretize in maybe in a different way or for the, for the, for the uh, standard model. Also, then you discretize, you put things on a lattice. And then all you need to know in order to describe the systems are what are the interactions between the different lattice sites. So these lattice sites will be composed of spins or electrons or, or whatever. And in order to uh, have a model, this lattice model, you must know and have to know what are the interactions between the different constituents. And so for example, so if there is a spin here and another spin here, so what is the interaction between those two spins? And by interaction, what we mean is the energy of interaction. So what we want to know is what is the energy and, uh, uh, of different configurations. So for example, you have a spin here up and a spin down. So then they will attract or repel depending if these are magnets. And there is an energy associated to that. And so we would like to know what is the energy of this configuration. And we would like to know all over the lattice. 
And in physics, this function, this entity, which is a function of the configuration, so we typically write in terms of something that we call a Hamiltonian. So from now on, you will hear very, very often this word Hamiltonian, like quantum Hamiltonian complexity. So I will specify later on what I mean, but, but basically it's just the energy. So you give me a configuration, you give me a configuration of the spins, and then this, is, this gives you, it's a function that gives you the energy for this configuration. And that's all we need to know in order to uh, answer the questions, or almost everything we need to know in order to answer the questions that I told you before. So you give in a system like that, and you put it on a lattice, and you're able to know what is this Hamiltonian, this function, then in principle you should be able to answer the questions about how this, this system will behave. And so why? Well, because the properties like uh, transport, magnetic, all the physical properties that are here are a function of this energy themselves. So for example, if you have thermal equilibrium, so you take your system and uh, your material and you wait for a while, then we know that because of the interaction with the environment, it gets into some state, some configuration, which is what we call thermal equilibrium. And the thermal equilibrium, according to physics, is a function only of temperature, a parameter, and this Hamiltonian, so this energy function. And you want to know what is the dynamic, so what happens if you touch the system, change some spins, so then they, they, how they will evolve. Then we know that the dynamics can be described in terms, again, of this Hamiltonian, of this function of the configuration, uh, time, okay, because we want to know as a function of time, the parameter time, and the initial configuration. So that's why it's so important for us, this Hamiltonian. So you will see it later on, I mean, with examples and so on, but that's why it's a central part of a model in physics, not only what is the lattice, but also what is the energy corresponding to the different configurations. This is what we call the Hamiltonian. I mean, for the moment, it's not very precise. What I'm saying will become more precise later on. But, but if, you have this, if you know this Hamiltonian, then in principle you can calculate everything else and you can calculate and, and make the predictions about what will happen with the systems. However, as this is the point of the talk, is that that's not enough, even though uh, everything is encoded in this Hamiltonian, the, the answer to your questions, actually it may be very difficult to predict the physical behavior even if you know this Hamiltonian. This is a difficult problem and that's why we say that it's a complex, a complex problem. Okay, so I, Actually, now the following, I will give you some examples to illustrate that. So for you, some of you computer scientists, you will understand them very well. But I want to distinguish so, uh, between classical and quantum systems. So for the moment, if you don't know what quantum system means, just forget about that. I'll start with classical system, which is very simple to understand, and then I'll jump to quantum systems. And so I imagine that I have now a classical spin system. So we have now this... Uh, classical spin, so you want these are bits, you know, they can be a spin up, spin down, you take the value, let's say, plus one and, and minus one, and, uh, and so this is a configuration, that's our lattice, and for example, in two dimensions, like this uh, drawn here, and imagine that somebody gives us what is this energy of each configuration, so it gives us a way of determining, giving a configuration, what is the energy of this configuration. And I'm going to assume that we have local interactions, and so what it means is that this function of energy only depends on pairwise configurations. It's a sum of all possible pairwise uh, uh, configurations, or a function of the pairwise configurations, and, uh, but not, not longer. So in other words, the, the thought, if you give me a, a configuration like this one here, like down, up, 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 then I can calculate the energy just by looking at these two, at these two, at these two, at these two, at all the pairs. And that's uh, what happens in physics. We know that all the theories in physics from first principles are local, so things interact only with the things that are close to them. And so there are some other theories which are effective theories which are non-local. This will not be covered by my talk. So I'm concentrate late, um, from now on on local theories in which this energy is a sum of energies that depend locally on what are the configurations locally. And I will consider also the case of zero temperature. So what, what it means in this context is that I want to know what is the configuration that minimizes this energy. This is the solution to the problem. Okay, so I'll give you an, an, an example, a classical. So what, what is the configuration that minimizes the energy? So imagine that I give you this configuration and I give you the energy. So how can you solve the problem? How can you find what is the configuration that minimizes the energy? And after that, after you have this configuration, then in principle, this should solve a problem. So you can calculate whether it's a magnet or it's not a magnet or it will be the behavior of the system. 
Well, what you have to do is to take first the configuration with all spins are down. This will be 0, 0, 0, 0. Then you plug it in this formula, and then you calculate some energy. So here are some energy. We will have some units, whatever it is. Then you take 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then you compute the formula, and then you get this energy. And then you go all over all or possibilities, and then at the end, you just look up this table, and you say, oh, that's the lowest energy, so this is the configuration. But of course, this, this method, which is, is trivial, it's very bad, because you have to make a lot of calculations. So there are two to the n configurations. So if n is of the order of 50 or 100, then it's impossible to carry out this problem. So this is why this problem, unless there is some structure, is difficult. Of course, one can think that there are ways of better calculating that or finding that. But actually, there, for a general problem, even if you give configurations uh, that are local, like I'm giving here, actually, it's a hard problem. We know that it's NP-hard. And therefore, I mean, it takes an exponential time to solve the problem as a function of the number of lattice sites, of the number of, of, of spins. What happens in physics is that in many cases, actually, these this, this, uh, uh, functions that appear here are not so arbitrary. They have not an arbitrary function. But there are some symmetries. So you take a piece of material. Mo many materials are homo homogeneous or quasi-homogeneous. You take this, this floor, and then over a, a scale, I mean, it, it, it behaves the same in one position and in another position and in another position. And so what it means in practice is that in mm, many interesting cases, the function that appears here is homogeneous. Namely, the interaction between particle 1 and 2 is the same as in particle uh, 2 and 3 and 3 and 4, etc., etc. So this function is not so arbitrary. And you see that if you put this in the problem, then sometimes then you can solve it right away. So for example, let's take just the simplest case in which we take another problem in which now the energy of configuration is given here. So the energy, if the two spins are pointing in the same direction, is minus 1. And the energy of uh, the configuration in which they are pointing in different direction is equal to plus 1. Then you don't have to look over all configurations. You can see right away that the configuration which all the the spins are up, or all the spins are down, will minimize the energy, you know, because it's the lowest that you can have in the energy. You're always adding minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and then you can solve it. So in this case, well, we know that the solution, there are two solutions, which minimize the energy. So you have a material described by this model, and you cool it down to a low temperature. Then all the spins will look in the same direction. They will be like magnets all pointing in the same direction. It will be like a big magnet, and this will be a magnetic material. So this is what we call ferromagnetic material. So what we see is that sometimes when you have uh, some symmetry in your problem, and this happens very often in physics, then you can solve the problem and it becomes very simple. You can have another model in which now that's the other way around. So the, the configuration here is, has a positive energy, energy positive if they are in the same point in the same direction, and minus 1 if they are in different direction. And you don't need to do the same calculation. I mean, you can do it in many ways. One way is just redefine the model flip every second spin, the B lattice, and then you're back to the model that you had before. Then you know the solution. You flick it back, and then you see that the lowest energy is just having alternating uh, spins. So this is also a model that just by looking at it basically directly, then you can solve it. So again, this is un called antiferromagnetic. This is not a magnet. This is a different material. It has completely different properties than the previous one. So in conclusion from the first classical part, so if you take a classical problem of spins, in a lattice, and you want to know what is the zero temperature behavior of the system, that's very difficult in, 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 in general. However, in practice, in many cases that for, or interest in, in physics, so especially when you have homogeneity, when you have translational invariance, then the system, I mean, the, the problem simplifies and then you can solve it in an, in an efficient way. And on top of that, okay, there are many numerical methods to try to approximate uh, these, these, these models and uh, that work at finite temperature. So maybe at, it's very difficult sometimes to calculate what is the ground state, or sorry, the, the, the lowest energy configuration. But maybe you don't care so much about what is the lowest energy <laughs> configuration, but you want to know what are the low energy properties of the configurations that have low energies, and you may still uh, 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 I mean, find it out numerically. But I don't want to, to enter that, that field. So I will make some comments at the end about that. But at the moment, that's the, the conclusion. So now let's change to, to quantum systems. So actually, the materials uh, that are composing our world actually don't, on, don't obey the, the laws of classical mechanics. So in some cases, you cannot treat them in the way that I treat them before. You cannot treat them like uh, magnets that are spin up and spin down, and they have 
these two configurations because they know that they are composed of other particles, they are composed of atoms and the atoms of electrons and nuclei and so on, and they obey the laws of quantum mechanics. So sometimes it's required to use a quantum description, quantum, phys uh, quantum uh, mechanical description of these systems, and as we will see, this makes the problems even more difficult than the classical ones. And so let me a couple of words about quantum, quantum physics. So as you know, it was developed during uh, the uh, 100 years ago, starting from the hypothesis of Planck, who basically said uh, something which was a kind of a scandal at that time. So uh, as, as you probably know, and, and from this, and the uh, uh, 19th century and 17th century, so people were convincing themselves that light had to be a wave could not be made out of particles. And, uh, and there were some people before who said that light should be particles, so when I see something, is that there's something is bouncing on my eye. But then there's also phenomena that could not be described in terms of particles. And these were diffraction and, interfer and, uh, interfer uh, and interference phenomena. Uh, but on the other hand, there were some other experiments that they were doing at the end of the 19th century in which they could only be understood if actually the light was made out of particles, what now we call photons. And Planck was the person who pointed that out. And after that, there was the revolution, which came out to the fact that nowadays, so we can understand from elementary particles all the way to nuclear atoms, molecules, and even material. And we believe that all of them are described with, with quantum, quantum mechanics. And I mean, just to, just to mention uh, a number, so we, we can make measurements today of predictions made of out of quantum mechanics with 13 and 14 digits. So it's the best ever, uh, let's say, verified or, or test, tested theory that we have ever had. So, so actually it's a very accurate, and so we believe that it's, and when we have a material, so if you could uh, uh, solve the quantum mechanical problem, then you could describe everything that will, will happen there. Okay, so it's a theory that we believe very well, at least for this, for this system that are here. And we also understand very well that under some conditions, when you have quantum mechanics and some conditions occur, then you can replace quantum mechanics by classical mechanics. So going to the case of materials, so sometimes we know that the materials, we don't have to have a quantum description, but the, the spins up and this magnet is enough, but sometimes that's not enough, and that's the ones that I want to, to describe here. Okay, so for the ones who have not uh, heard uh, about quantum mechanics, or only uh, uh, superficially, let me uh, remind you of, of one of the main issues of quantum mechanics, which, was, which is very puzzling. And that's uh, Dorit, when she gave a talk, I mean, she had the same transparency. I think that we physicists and computer scientists, when we want to describe quantum mechanics, we show it very often. It's the double slit experiment. It's, it's a very simple experiment that was done already more than 100 years ago, in which they put a, a, a source of light, and then they make two holes, two slits in the, in the wall, and they let the pass go through, and they put a screen after that, and they see where the light comes. And if you do this experiment, and this light has to be a bit special, it cannot be the light that is coming from, from, from the bulb, it has to be from a laser, it has to be monochromatic, then what you will see is that the light appears in some particular ways and does not appear in some other ways. And that's nothing else but the interference phenomena, which uh, led people to think that light was made, made out of waves. And because otherwise it's very difficult to understand this, this phenomenon. And in fact, I mean, the, the way that you describe in terms of, of waves, is, you say, okay, so there is some light and the wave is coming here. And then when the light crosses the holes, then there is some wave crossing over here, and some wave that starts here, some wave that starts here, like the, the sea waves. And these sea waves now they propagate, like in the sea. And then if you look at some position, then it may happen that at this position, the crest of the uh, wave comes together, coming from here, comes at the same time that the crest of the wave coming from the other side. So this is why you have maximum energy, maximum light coming there. And in some of the positions, then is the, the valley of the wave, with the valley of the wave is coming, and there is, there is no light, and that's why, I mean, this is the phenomenon of interference, basically. So, but as I mentioned before, so Planck in, in 1900, so he said that in order to understand some other phenomena, I mean, the description was not good enough, so you should describe it in terms of particles. So, then how can one understand that if you have a source of light which is emitting photons, these like small balls, and they cross the, the two holes that you can have some places where there is light coming and places where there is no light coming. And that's really a puzzle. It's really a puzzle because, I mean, if they were balls, if you do this experiment with tennis balls, then you will see that some of them appear in this region and some of them appear with this region. So the ones that go to the first hole will appear in this region and the other ones in this region. So you will not see some uh, fringes. You will see just two regions. However, Actually, uh, you can do the experiment with light, and you do the experiment, and then you see that, in fact, this is what happens. 
So people may, may think that, okay, this is w what happens. We, we may have still these particles, but what happens is that they push each other, and because uh, they push each other, then this is why they decide to go to some regions and, and to, uh, to disappear from some of the regions. Well, actually, this is not true, because the experiments are done now for many years, sending just a single photon per second. So there is, at a time, only one photon inside this region, and you still see that the first photon appears here, maybe the second here randomly appears, but when you have recorded many things, then you see that they appear in fringes. So they decide one by one to appear in some places and it, not in some other places. And uh, so if you think about that and you cut this description of the ball, the only way of understanding this uh, kind of experiment is that each of the photons had to go through both slits at the same time. And that's, of course, very counterintuitive, no? because uh, we don't see that the uh, tennis ball go through two slits at the same time. But actually, that's the only way around to, to, to saying that you have uh, uh, particles and interference. And that's something that is very weird about quantum mechanics, somehow that the life of these particles can uh, kind of uh, double, and then in one life is doing something, and in another life is doing something else. And when we think that that's a property of, of photons, but that's not true. This experiment has been done with electrons. So one is able to take electrons from here, one electron after one electron, make this lead, put it in this sees the fringes again. So the electrons also go through the two holes at the same time. But when we think that the electrons are too elementary and they're weird particles, well, people have done this experiment with atoms, with whole atoms composed of nuclei and electrons, and with molecules, and with weak molecules, so with fullerens, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that we understand very well, and is described by quantum mechanics. And if you want to describe it with your hands, then you have to say, that the particle, each of the particles went through the two slits at the same time. Of course, this doesn't make sense. So one has to learn quantum mechanics to understand what I mean by what I'm saying. But that's one of the features of quantum mechanics, which, of course, has very surprising uh, properties. And you have maybe teleportation and some other words that are, I mean, this is responsible for the existence of these possibilities. But actually, this is also responsible for the fact that quantum problems or describing quantum mechanical materials, it's very hard, as I will show you in a second. Okay, so taking now uh, what we learned from these double slit experiments, it tells us that, uh, so when we have a particle like this spin that I mentioned before, so we described it before as a, as, a, as a bit, basically spin up or spin down, zero, one values, but in quantum mechanics, this is not enough. So we can have not only spin up, but the spin down, but we can ha also have the two possibilities at the same time. So this is what we call superposition, and that's something that comes in quantum mechanics and doesn't make any classical sense. So, and that's something that we write in this form. So at the moment you don't have to understand this formula. This only, only tells you that you have at the same time zero and one in the same way that this particle could be at the same time in the left and the right uh, uh, slit when they went through. And what is important is to know that in quantum mechanics you have to, each of these <coughs> possibilities, each of these configurations now that they can occur at the same time are weighted by some complex factor. This is what we call the coefficients of the superposition. And these coefficients will tell us whether we are very classical or we are not very classical. For example, if the first coefficient is, let's say, if this coefficient is zero, then we have, we have just state, what we call state zero, which means that we have like, like a spin down, a very classical spin down. And if this coefficient is zero, then it means that we have the spin up, so it's a very classical I mean, state of the spin, but actually these coefficients may be different from zero. And then what they tell us is if we would measure this spin, what would be the probability of obtaining certain outcome? So if I take a spin, and this quantum spin is described by, let's say, this formula here, then if I want to calculate, if I measure now if it's spin up or spin down, this C0, actually the, the absolute value square, will tell us the probability of obtaining, uh, having it in zero, and one, the, having it in one. This is not so important for the moment. The point that I want to make is that, in classically, a bit can take two configurations. 0 and 1. And if I tell you, tell you that my bit is 0 and 1, you don't have to know anything else. However, in quantum mechanics, there are more possibilities. If I want to tell you what is my system, what is the state of my system, so what is my system doing, I will have to tell you how much is C0 and C1. So I will have to tell you not only if it's 0 or up, but I will have to tell you what are these complex coefficients. Now you can have many of these pins, for example, two, and something similar happens. So you have now two classical bits then they can be in four possible configurations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. However, if you have now quantum spins, then they can be 
in these four possible configurations, but also in any superposition thereof. So it could be at the same time in 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And now you, you want to specify, so what is the quantum state of the system? So you want to predict anything about the system, then you have to tell me what is the coefficient in front of each of the co configuration. So you will have to give me four coefficients. Actually, one example of that is a very famous example that appears many times in physics is this 0, 1, minus 1, 0. You have to spin this is what we call singlet. And just let me give you an example where the singlet appears. So now let's go back to uh, the spin lattices. And imagine that I have a lattice, which is called Kagome lattice, which has this structure. It's like a, the, the David stars putting next together. And you can have, for example, a, a system uh, of spins, quantum spins, in which this pair is in a singlet, 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 and this is what we call a valence one state. So it's, it's like the pairs are paired you know, with each other in some particular configuration. And if you write down this state, so you will have to take the state, the state, the state, multiply them out, so you will have a, a superposition of many, 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 many configurations at the same time. Actually, you can have another even fancier state if you realize, so here what we're doing is that we're pairing the vertices of these lattices, the nearest neighbor lattices, and man, there are many ways of pairing them. So for example, instead of putting this singlet here, singlet here, singlet here, you could have the singlet here, another singlet here, another singlet here, in such a way that they don't overlap. And this would be another balance one state. But now you can have, according to quantum mechanics, also the linear superposition of all these possible configurations. They're very complicated the state. This is what is called a resonating balance bond state. In this, I just wanted to give you an example of some states that can appear. And actually, this has some relevance because it's related to some very fancy properties of materials. Anyway, uh, let, me, let me go back to the, to the case of spins. And now, with quantum mechanics, now imagine that now we have the same lattice as before, where we have these small magnets, but these magnets now are described quantum mechanical. So they are not either spin down or spin up. So they can have these superpositions. So it means that if I want to know what is the state at zero temperature, and I want to tell you what is the state at, uh, uh, at zero temperature such that you can make any prediction, you want to know whether it's conducting or conducting other properties, then I will have to give you all the possible coefficients for all possible configurations. So just writing down the state that, 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 uh, that is, let's say, the relevant state involves two to the n complex coefficient that I have to give you. And if you want to compute anything, so once you have the state, maybe you want to know some configuration, maybe you want to know what is the energy of the configuration, because at the end you want to know what is the one that, that minimizes the energy, the, 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 the configuration that minimizes the energy, the lowest temperature, then, then you will have to calculate some uh, expectation values with, those, with all these coefficients, you will have to do an exp also a huge number of computations. And this is where the problem in, in quantum, the additional problem in quantum physics comes from. That I mean, not, not finding the configuration is, is, is difficult. It's just writing down. If I, if, I, if I tell you, if I know what is the configuration, I want to write it down, then I have to give you a vector with 2 to the n coefficients. So if n is of the order of 50, then, I mean, we cannot put it in any computer. And if it's 300, 300 spins, then if we could store one bit of information in all the particles of the universe, all the atoms of the universe would not be enough to. And that's the problem. This explosion of coefficients in quantum mechanics, even to specify the state, not even to calculate properties. So that's a problem, a new problem that, ent uh, that enters when we're describing these uh, many body systems, quantum many body systems. And the second one is that once you imagine that I give you these this coefficients so that I tell you what is my configuration, then you would like to uh, calculate something that you have to make predictions. And according to the rules of quantum mechanics, the predictions are just calculating expectation values. You take this vector, put some operator here, which will be the physical property that you want to describe. And then you have to multiply it uh, again with the vector. So this will require an exponential number of simple calculations. So the time that it will require to do this computation will also grow exponentially with the, with the size of your system. And so that's I mean, an additional problem in quantum physics that, that, that is not in classical physics. And one could say, so what happens with symmetry? Do you remember the classical? I told you, well, we, we know that we have certain symmetries. We know that all the, uh, uh, that you have a homogeneous system. Then this helps a lot. Well, actually, in these problems, this doesn't help a lot because there are many, 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 many configurations which are homogeneous. And classically, you have two only, oh, spins up and spin down. These are the ones that are homogeneous. Quantum mechanically, 
there are many. Actually, there are two to the n divided by n. So you can see, for example, this is one. This is a superposition which I have. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, plus 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, plus 0, plus 1, 0, 0. So this, if you see, actually is, is even permutational invariant. It's homogeneous and permutational invariant, and it's a valid configuration. It's neither all zeros nor all one, and there are many of them, exponentially many. So giving, telling you that you have translational invariants may not help so much to solve, to solve the problem as it did in the, class, in the classical case. Okay, so now we can compare classical and quantum problems. So classical problems, the description, it's obviously easy, it's a configuration which requires n bits of information to tell you what is the solution. The physical properties, one I, once I know the configuration, it's very simple. You just have to compute n times and you have to do some operation. And find the configuration may be difficult. Yeah? This uh, problem is NP hard, as we said before, but in some cases it becomes easy. But quantum, the quantum system in full generality, everything is difficult. Even describing the system is difficult. And uh, that's a challenge if you want to describe properties of material, like the one that I mentioned before, because it has quantum properties, it cannot be described classically. Or you want to solve the standard model, or you want to study chemical reactions, etc., etc. OK, but however, I mean, that's not the end of it. So I mean, at the end, people, chemists, are able to, to, to predict things with their chemical systems. And there are many materials that we know how to behave. So what happens is that uh, there are some conditions under which these problems become easy. And so, so that's actually what we were studying in this, in, this, in this program. So we wanted to know under which conditions. So if maybe it's, if it's homogeneous, it's not enough. But all the conditions which are very physically relevant, maybe the problems become easy, and then you can solve it. And we wanted to assess. So where do, the, do a classification of, of quantum problems. So let me give you, give you some, some uh, possibilities. So for example, uh, then I did some, so I was, I was working with a description in which I'm working with these long vectors. But maybe there is another description that does not require to write vectors in this huge space. Maybe there is a more efficient description of, the, of, this, of these configurations, which is not exponential in space. And so this would mean that maybe we can do computation much better. On the other hand, so actually, we don't want to have, we don't need to have the whole state. We don't need all these two to the end coefficients. At the end, we want to calculate, we want to compute some microscopic properties. As I mentioned before, we want to know whether this system is superconducting, is a magnet, is not a magnet, how it will react. Some very simple <coughs> questions. We don't need to do the end coefficient. So maybe, I mean, in order to solve the question, we're overdoing it just yes, by trying to get all the information about this, this, uh, this uh, uh, quantum superposition. So in fact, as I mentioned before, actually, there are many methods to describe many body quantum systems. We work to condensed matter through high energy physics. And so they have their methods, and they are able to solve problems because they're relying on some of these, some of these properties. But uh, even with the methods that we have in hand, I mean, there are still some problems that cannot be addressed. Actually, many problems that cannot be addressed with current methods. And that's, I mean, that's the example that I told you before. It's an open problem. Many, uh, there are open problems also in high energy and many other problems in, in chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why, I mean, this is the motivation of this project to, to, to try to assess this now from the computer science point of view. What is difficult, what not? And if it's difficult, maybe try to, to, to find algorithms for which this is simple. OK, so this is, these are some results during the last years. And I'm very sorry about the, the reference here. So my reference here, I mean, are not, are not uh, uh, very appropriate. But anyway, I didn't have time to look it up, and, and I didn't remember. So that's a summary of some of the results, actually, that have occurred during the last year, have been revised in this workshop, and in particular last week's uh, tensor network meeting. And actually, so now you can have <coughs> Uh, physical systems which have some extra conditions that are very relevant from a physical point of view, and then this, these problems become easy. And one example is when you have a one-dimensional system, so you have like one cable, not a three-dimensional, but just one cable, and the system is gapped. And I'll explain it in a second what I mean by, by gapped. In that case, actually, uh, by people here show that, that the description is easy, that not using Hilbert space and all that, but just the, another method, they show that to the computer, the, the, the physical properties is simple, and to find what is the, the smallest energy configuration is, is easy. And I'll, I'll, I want to explain it a little bit. And in higher dimensions, then it happens that you, you add an extra condition on top of that. So it's not only that this, the interactions are local that I mentioned, but they are also gap, but also that the density of states grows polynomially with a number of sites, which I will explain in a second. Then it turns out that the description is easy. But still, we don't know how to, how to find efficiently the, the, the physical properties or to find the, the configuration. So it's getting a little bit more like classical, like classical problems. And I want to explain a little bit this, this diagram. So what do we mean? And now it's getting a little bit more, more technical, the talk. 
So what, what do I mean by these gap uh, systems? So at the end, remember that I told you that if we have a, a, a one of these spin systems, then everything is described in terms of this Hamiltonian. This is the energy not for each configuration. And at the end, this Hamiltonian is like a big matrix, which is composed now by some elements. So this is a sum of the energy of this configuration, quantum configuration, the energy of this configuration. So we write this Hamiltonian as a sum of terms, like the case of the classical case. And now this is a big, a big matrix. And it turns out that the minimal configuration is nothing else mm, mathematical. To find the minimal configuration reduces to finding what is the eigenvector corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue of this big matrix. So this is what we say, colloquially we say, we have to find what is the ground state of that Hamiltonian. So the ground state of that Hamiltonian, so the eigenvector corresponding to the minimum eigenvalue, is the solution, will be the state, the solution, so will be the state of that system at zero temperature. And so now you can understand that if we want to make a statement of how difficult it is to find the ground state, to find the eigen uh, eigenvector of this, of this big matrix, then this will have something to do with the spectrum of this, of this uh, Hamiltonian, of this matrix. And in fact, now you can have different kinds of spectrums. So depending on how your interactions are, then you look at the spectrum. So it could be something like that. There will be like the minimum energy. This is the next energy, the next energy, the next energy. So this is a finite matrix. So it will have a discrete spectrum. So there are some values. And this is for some lattice size, let's say for N0 particles in your lattice size. And this is, the, this is the state that you're interested in, the one that minimizes the energy. That's the one that you want to find. Now, what can happen is that you increase the lattice side, you make it bigger, and now there will be more, as your matrix is larger, so it has more eigenvalues, so it will be more values in the spectrum. And now you increase more, then there will be more and more and more, and actually the maximum will go up as well. I mean, there are some conditions that have to be fulfilled, but that's a typical thing what happens. So we say that, uh, that a Hamiltonian or a system is gapped when the distance, the energy distance between the, 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 this uh, ground state and the next uh, eigenvalue, it's bounded from below. So it remains constant, larger than zero, for any value of n. So you would increase your system, make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, still there is a gap here. This is why it's called gap. And it turns out that generically, this is true in, in the Hamiltonians that appear in, in nature. So you take a Hamiltonian that appears in nature, which is homogeneous, and you just write random numbers, put it there, then I mean, this is something that typically occurs. So this is why these are relevant cases, the case of gap Hamiltonian. And so the gap Hamiltonian actually uh, uh, physically, basically means that the state will be robust. So if you're at zero temperature and you modify something, the physical properties of your state will not change, and that's what happens in practice. The things will change changes a little bit, I and mean, this doesn't explode. So that's one of the properties that occurs. And it is also related to something which is called finite correlation. And so whenever you have a gap in your system, then automatically you know that the correlations in your system will decay exponentially, and there will be a typical length. So you do you measure something here and something here, and you get a longer and longer distance, and they don't have to do anything with each other completely decorrelated. OK, so again, so you take now one-dimensional systems. Well, maybe, maybe I'll explain first, first the other. So this is, what, is, what, is a, what, what we mean by gap. Now, what about the other condition for higher dimensions? This is the density of state. So let's take the spectrum, again, of our Hamiltonian and increase the number of particles. And let's consider some value, some energy. And let's make a line like that. Okay, and we consider that this energy is always there. You renormalize the energy in such a way that energy is always the same here. So now what we can do is that we can count how many states are here. So how many states have energy smaller than this E, and see how this number increases as we have bigger and bigger lattices. So this is what is called the density of states for a system of n sites corresponding to some energy A. E is the number of states that are here. And this number typically will grow so because they, they are more, uh, the matrix is bigger, then there are more numbers in the spectrum, the more, more, more uh, eigenvalues in this region. However, now this can increase in different ways. And one possible way is that it increases polynomially. So it increases kind of slowly. Uh, you're putting, making it bigger and bigger and bigger. Then there are not too many states. I say all, most of the states are appearing in the center. So that's the condition that the density of states you know, has some particular uh, uh, property. 
and a way of thinking about that, so what does this corresponds physically? So what it means basically is that your system can be thought of systems of different patches. So that since you, since you, since you have gap, you have a finite correlation length, things that are far away are decorrelated, then you have like a patch here which has nothing to do with something that is far away, then here they have another patch. You can think of your system made out of patches and, think and study things locally. And if you have systems with patches, if they would be really systems of patches, then they fulfill this condition. It's very simple to see that, that then they fulfill this condition and that's why it's related to that. Okay, and that's also a very generic property. I mean, that's harder to say. I mean, harder to, I mean, we know that there are counterexamples to that, but in most of the physical Hamiltonians that appear in nature, and this is a property that also occurs. So now going back to the, this, to the table that I had before, so it seems that for one dimensional relevant systems in physics, then we have that all these problems are easy. And for the relevant uh, problems in, in, in physics, or many of the relevant problems in physics, the description is easy. Still calculating things with them or finding the configuration which is the ground state is difficult. And now I want to, I want to explain that. So I want to explain why this description is easy. So what do we do? Do we, do we don't work in Hilbert space? We don't write these, these vectors anymore? We, we use a different language to do that and also to do that. And that's what, what is called a tensor network uh, description. And that was actually the, 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 the subject of the workshop that took place in this, in this uh, uh, Simons Institute. Uh, last week. Okay, so coming back to the original problem, I have a lattice model describing some physical system. This lattice model is quantum, so we have quantum spins systems, and uh, so we have a Hamiltonian, so we know what are the interactions between the systems, and the question is we would like to know what is the ground state, what is the minimal energy configuration, and from the ground state, so we're going to, proper, uh, to, to calculate properties like energies or, or magneti magnetization, etc., etc. Now, as, as I mentioned before, this ground state at the end will be a vector which has these two to the n components. But actually, this is, over, this is uh, a, a killer. So we don't need these too many components. And it's very simple to see that just counting parameters. So this vector lives in a space which has this dimension 2 to the power n. This is the dimension of the Hilbert space with this, with this vector lives. But actually, it, it cannot be that we can somehow that we need the whole vector, that all vectors are possible. And this is because we are asking a very peculiar question. We are asking what is the ground state of a matrix which has a very special form. So it's local. So it's only it's a sum of interactions of particles which are next to each other. This is a very specific question. So what it means in practice is that actually from the whole Hilbert space, actually there will be only one corner of this Hilbert space where our vectors will be living. They are very special. They are uh, ground states of some, or they are eigenvectors of some peculiar matrices, so they have to be very special. And this is the hint that, gives, that, that tells us that maybe there is a way of describing, not just by writing these vectors, but using a different description. And so let's, let me do this counting of parameters because it's very simple. So, so why I'm saying that? Well, you see, so this, this uh, Hamiltonian that is here depends basically on uh, the interaction that I have here, so it's, it's a sum of interactions. So it will depend on the interactions between these two particles, these two particles, these two particles, these two particles, these two particles. So how many pairs of particles do we have? Well, if uh, everybody interacts with everybody, they are n squared. But here they're even less because they're, everybody is interacting only with the neighbors. So it would be something like the number of particles times the coordination numbers of fours in two dimensions, or something like that. So four, four times n terms in this sum. And each of the terms that appears here tells me what is the interaction between these two, these two spins. Only two spins. That's not dependent on it anymore. So it's a constant number. So actually, this will be something like 16 parameters. So the total, all the possible Hamiltonians you know, that we are considering here depend only on 16 times n, or, or, or sorry, uh, something that grows linearly with n, with a number of, with a number of particles. But the ground state is a function of this Hamiltonian. If I give you the Hamiltonian, it's like specifying the ground state. So the ground state may only depend, or can only depend on these, let's say, n parameters, or 20 n uh, parameters, not exponentially. And this is what we say, is a qualitative way of saying that only some quarter of Hilbert space, a zero measure, let's say, uh, manifold of states that we live there, or vectors that we live there, are relevant for our ground state. So when we are trying to write all these vectors with all these, uh, the, with all these coefficients, we are overdoing it because we are treating all possible states here on equal footing, and actually this is not what we want. We are solving some very specific problem. 
And in fact, that's what gives us the hint that there might be a better description, and this gives us the hint why this can be work better. Okay, so maybe maybe there is a description of this corner, which is the relevant corner of Hilbert space that we call, that that uh, that has very few parameters. So the number of parameters only grows, let's say, polynomially with the number of particles, and for which maybe we can calculate physical properties efficiently and find what is the configuration efficiently. But how, how do we find this corner of Hilbert space? And so I'll tell you what is the hint that, that guided people to find this corner of Hilbert space, and that's what is called uh, area law. And so let me explain also qualitatively what this area law is. So it turns out that uh, the ground states, so the zero energy configurations of these particular Hamiltonians, which are local, uh, uh, which have local interactions, have, uh, well, it's conjecture, and in some cases it's proven, that fulfills some uh, kind of universal law. And this law is represented here. So this is the lattice again. And imagine that now from the lattice I take one uh, subsystem. So this is what I call subsystem A. Now in the subsystem A, we can calculate what is the entropy. The entropy is an is a, is a, is a informational uh, uh, informa information theoretical uh, variable, but it's also a thermodynamic variable, basically with the same meaning. We have to extend it to quantum mechanics, but can be extended. And you can, you can calculate what is the entropy of this region if you're in the ground state of the system. And it turns out that if you take any vector on Hilbert space, a random vector on this space, then it will scale. So the, this entropy will be a number for this region, which will be proportional to the number of particles you have in this region. However, in the case that we are in the corner of Hilbert space, of relevant Hilbert space, it turns out that this is not so. So that the entropy of this region depends only on the particles, the number of is proportional to the particles that are in the boundary of this region. This is what is called the area. It depends on the area, not on the volume of the system. And that's very peculiar. And actually, as I mentioned before, it can, for example, for gap systems in one dimension, it can be proven. For gap systems in two dimensions with density of states fulfilling what I told you can be proven. It's something that is very generic in these cases. But this tells us, th so this tells us that, that actually there is a way that we can look for this description of Hilbert space. So what is, what is the idea? The idea is to find all the descrip all, uh, a description in such a way that all states fulfilling the area law have uh, 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 are within this description. Okay, so you look at a way of formulating or of writing states, let's say configurations, not in field space, but in a different way, in such a way that the number of parameters is small, scales polynomially with the number of particles, but we are sure that if a state fulfills the area law, it can be written with this description, with this polynomial number of parameters. And therefore, since the state, the target ground state fulfill the area laws, then we will be able to write them with this description efficiently. That's a little bit the, the idea behind that. And so, uh, so maybe let me tell you what is, a, uh, what is a, uh, an intuitive idea behind this area law that can be proven in some cases. So, uh, so the, the entropy, now it gets a bit more complicated, but the entropy in quantum information, in quantum physics, Measures so how much you have, an in, how much uh, you are entangled, or region A is entangled to region B. Okay, so you have a, a product state, so you have something which doesn't have these kind of superpositions that uh, that I mentioned before. Then it turns out that if you calculate the entropy is zero, and the more you are superposition, more you have entanglement, then you uh, uh, then this entropy grows. It's a measure of entanglement, in fact, this entropy in quantum information. So, but now imagine that we have a cap system, like the ones that I mentioned before. Then we know that there is a correlation length. So it means that only the particles that are around this region here will be correlated, will be kind of entangled. And so if you calculate now what is the entropy, what is the entanglement between the interior and the exterior, it will depend only on the particles that are in this region. So it will be equal to the numbers that are on the boundary times this correlation length. And this is why you have this area law for gap systems, and that's why these systems are very peculiar. Okay, so actually, now in the case of the area law, so it has been actually for one dimensional systems that are gap has been proven that there is a uh, area law. Even for, criti crit for critical systems, some systems that are gapless but uh, somehow are relevant in physics for some other reasons, are scale invariant, etc., etc., they fulfill an area law only with a violation which goes like the logarithm of the size of your system. And in higher dimension, also you take gap systems with these conditions from the density of states, you also violate the area law. So it's quite a generic, generic rule. Okay, so if you have this rule, then 
you can think of a, of a, of a, of a description. And I'll, I'll finish with that. And now it gets a little bit more technical. So it's just the, the end of the talk. In terms of tensor network. So what is a tensor network? And why this describes efficiently the, the systems? And once you have this efficient description, then you can use this description in order to find these configurations and to compute things. And this is the way in which they prove uh, all these properties that I mentioned before. OK, so I come again about my, to my lattice system with a Hamiltonian, my state. I told you that my state can be written as a vector, a vector which has many components, like, like C, 0, 0, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2 to the n component. So let me write this vector as, as a tensor. It's a tensor which has n, uh, n indices, so the first index, second index, second, etc., etc. So I will write it like that. So this means that this is a tensor in which these are the indices of my tensor. And my Hamiltonian, my Hamiltonian is an operator, is a matrix, so it has now indices to the left and to the right. Okay, so it's just, uh, the same language. It's another tensor, but it has double the indices. So some of the indices are to the left and some of the indices are on the right. And when we calculate the energy, or when we calculate some expectation value, when we predict certain property in physics, what we do is that we calculate something like that. I told you, we take the vector, the vector, the matrix, the vector. So in this language, what we do is that we take the vector, we take the, the matrix, the vector, and then multiply. Multiply is like contracting indices. So at the end, quantum mechanics is nothing else but working with tensors, which have many indices. And the fact that they have many indices means that very, they are very difficult, because then there are many coefficients. And that's the problem that, uh, in terms of tensors. But now there are some special kind of tensors. And uh, this is what we call tensor networks. So imagine that the tensor that I have can be written in terms of smaller tensors. <coughs> these are these the smaller tensors that are here, that are contracted in some particular form. So for example, and this is a tensor, which is rank 3 tensor. And uh, now what we take is that this tensor here, so for example, if we put in this tensor the coefficient c 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, would be the same as putting in this tensor a 0 here, another 0 here, another 0 in these small tensors, and contracting all them together. So multiplying like matrices, contracting indices. Then you see that. I can, if this is equal to that, then I can describe these two to the n coefficients actually with much less effort. Why? Because the number of, of, of coefficients that I need to use are the number of coefficients to describe these small tensors. And the number of coefficients to describe this small tensor is the number of tensors times the number of coefficients for one tensor. And if this doesn't scale with n, then I will have that the number of tensors that I need to describe, the whole tensor actually scales only linearly with the, with the number of particles. OK, so by chance, it turns out that the states, which are the ground states, the solution to our problems, can be written in terms of contraction of smaller tensors. Then we may be able to describe them efficiently. Because instead of calculating this big tensor, we work with small tensors. And then we'll be able to solve the problem. So have no time to, to well, maybe, maybe to explain here. So this is an example. So this is what is called a matrix product state. It's a tensor for one-dimensional systems in which this tensor, the tensor, this coefficient, you write it in terms of these smaller tensors, contract it only horizontally. And uh, this is the same version if you call the correct entangled pair states in two dimensions, in which now the tensor, I mean the, the indices of the tensor are pointing out, and you get this tensor now just by contracting the tensor along the other, the other possible indices. OK, well, it turns out that I uh, uh, don't have time to, 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 to tell you. But one can show that if you, if you state fulfills the area law, okay, then you have an efficient description in terms of this tensor. So in fact, your tensor, your big tensor, can be decomposed in terms of smaller tensors. So then you can have, have a handle to describe it. And I mean, this is a conjecture. It's conjecture, and it's very likely that it's true. But in two dimensions, this is, also, this is also true. So that whenever we have an area law, then these different difficult tensors can be written in terms of smaller tensors. And then we have a, an efficient description. And this is why one can prove that under certain circumstances, we have efficient descriptions, because this can be made rigorous. And then you have efficient descriptions. And in the case of one dimensional system, then it turns out that you can compute uh, expectation values efficiently, because Con uh, calculating this expectation value now with this tensor, and one can see, and you, you know, just, just listen to what I say, is a matrix multiplication. So you have to take a small vector, a small vector, which is just these small tensors, and do matrix multiplication, and this can be done very efficiently. And this is why, so you have a problem which is gap, which is the area, you have a tensor description. This tensor description 
you can compute things efficiently and you can find it efficiently because of this property. Because at the end you can do matrix multiplications in which the size of the matrix does not depend on the on the size of the of the system or depend or depend only polynomially on the size of the system. That's why it's efficient. However, in two dimensions, you have a two-dimensional problem or a three-dimensional problem, then it turns out that you can, in fact, there exists a description in terms of these, you know, these tensors in, under certain circumstances. However, the problem is that you cannot compute uh, expectation values easily. So I had a, a small explanation, but let me tell you that this related to the fact that at the end, computing expectation value is contracting a big tensor, but now this tensor is very connected. So whenever you want to compute and calculate these properties, then it turns out that your tensor, when you are contracting, will become very big, will have many coefficients, and then this will explode. And this makes a difference between one-dimensional and two-dimensional. OK, so I want to just finish saying that, because this is uh, mentioned things that are known and that have been discussed in these workshops, that there are many, many other things that are not known, and people are working on that. So for example, so um, people are trying to describe critical systems, so systems that are not gapped with other tensor descriptions, not the ones that I mentioned here, some that are called three tensor networks, meta, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing is that maybe, since we're interested only in calculating some uh, physical properties, then we don't need to approximate the whole ground state. So maybe this tensor description is even too much to describe the whole thing because we're interested in very few things. So there are all the people trying to look at more efficient descriptions even than this tensor description. Another thing that I find very interesting is that in two dimensions, I told you that it's very difficult to contract these tensors, and this is why we cannot compute things in two dimensions. But if you have symmetries, it may happen that you can contract some of these tensors, in some cases, efficiently, and this will open up the possibility of describing not only one-dimensional systems, but also higher-dimensional systems efficiently. I didn't talk about zero finite temperature, so it turns out that, I mean, the same thing that I was explaining here works at finite temperature, and in some cases even better, dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Well, with that, I just uh, wanted to give you an overview, also what we have been discussing, and but emphasize is more than the technical details, so what were the motivations behind, what are the results that are known, and so what are some of the open problems in the, in the field. So thank you for your attention. second half of your talk was based on systems with a, a gap. Well, what's the motivation? Why should we care about systems with a gap? Because um, gap basically means robustness. Okay, So that you have to put a lot of energy to change the system. This is what it means, a gap. But if you have a system that is not robust, then you will not find it in nature. Okay, Because any perturbation will change it. So this is why many of the systems that we have in nature are gapped, and these are the interesting behavior. Of course, there are people who are interested in very exotic behaviors. So one happens when the states are very sensitive to certain conditions, and then this would be gapless system. So give us an example of a gap system. Gap, you care about. gap system, any yeah. insulator, for example. Anything that is compressed is not compressible. So. How about a gapless system? Example. Well, when you have, for example, uh, I mean, fermions moving uh, freely, okay, so particles moving just in a in a conductor without any resistance or anything. I mean, this is a this is a, a gapless system. But if you put any any impurity, then it will not move, and that will become the gap. So. Just a silly historical comment. You mentioned the interference is about hundred years old. You must be a very young man. No, no, it's about two hundred. Okay. <laughs> 18 or 4, if I remember right. Okay, well, yes, yes, yes. I'm sure that there, there are many, many imprecisions in, in my talk. Well, that's the only one that I can catch. Okay. It's good that a mathematician corrects a physicist on interference. <laughs> can you say anything more about the dynamics? Whether um, they're efficient? Okay, the dynamics is, is the difficult part. So, I, I mean, I personally believe, and some of us personally believe, that at the end, most of the systems that are interesting from the physical point of view, that are in thermal equilibrium, at zero temperature or finite temperature, but that have equilibrated, can be described efficiently. I mean, in some sense or another. But we believe that quantum systems that have dynamics, probably not. And uh, so systems in which you just make a perturbation and see what is the propagation of this perturbation. And one of the main reasons for that 
is because uh, 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 there exists something which is called a quantum computer, you may have heard of, that is a dynamical system in which uh, things are changing and that we believe that is much more powerful than any classical computer and that we cannot simulate efficiently. So in fact, if we would be able to simulate dynamics with these tensors or some other methods efficiently, then we will not need a quantum computer because we could do the computations classically. And what happens with these tensors, actually, is that when you have them, I mean, in the context of what I was explaining here, the way that you understand that with this tensor you cannot describe dynamics is that whenever you have dynamics, the area law uh, uh, is violated. So at a time that is constant, let's say, then the area law exports. And this is why this tensor description is no longer valid. hypothesis that uh, I guess the physical systems have a tensor description. Um, are there any experimental results that sort of, I don't know, that, or that you could design an experimental result that would sort of um, test this in some reasonable well, the, 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 I mean, what I say that, I mean, now going a little bit more detail, is based on, on the fact that at, a finite, at any finite temperature you have an, effic an, eff an, an, an efficient description if you have local Hamilton, I mean, local interactions, as we were discussing. And that at zero temperature, I mean, we get this n to the power log n, which, I mean, probably you can get rid of this log n at some point. I mean, it's not based on the area law, but it's based on a different, on a different uh, uh, reason why I mentioned that. But I didn't want to enter in, into, into this um, kind of exponential matrices and so on. Yes, uh, you mentioned this idea of Well, it's, I mean, it's, there, are, there might be exceptions, but um, if, uh, I mean, you take a textbook where they put examples uh, of typical Hamiltonians that appear, and you can solve, you will find that this is the case. And then I give you, I give you what is the, the, the kind of I mean, back of the envelope calculation. So indeed, if your system has finite correlation length, you may think of having different patches. Actually, you have to make it translational invariant, but this will give a good approximation of your state, this linear superposition of products of patches or translated and then if you have patches then this is fulfilled and if you have a linear superposition this keeps also this that's the, the intuitive the motivation behind it um, so about the local interactions so it's pretty clear what pairwise interactions means in 1d but in higher d is there like a problem in terms of whether you include the diagonal interactions no that's i mean all the statements are included in plaquette interactions as long as there is a finite range and some of the results can be even uh, can be extended to the fact that in, to the to the extent that you have exponentially decaying interactions at any length and many body interactions, and even some polynomial if they decay, so, uh, power law decay if it's sufficiently high. Um, so, uh, so, so you mentioned um, you know that um, that. Uh, when for natural systems, there should be an area law, including for critical systems with a log logarithmic connection. So, is, is there? A, can you think of a? Uh, you know, is there a way to formulate that statement, like in the gap case, in a in a form that might be made precise? So, yeah, well, it can, it's not, it can actually can be precise, even in the case that I mentioned. And but then, this is the definition of what critical is. Yeah. So, critical. Well, you can have two definitions. One. Is with the kind of uh, the scale invariant, okay? So that you calculate the correlation function at some distance. You multiply the distance by two. You have the same correlation function, but maybe divide uh, with one divided by two to the power delta. And if this happens for all possible correlation functions, you say that this that this is that this is uh, uh, scale invariant. And so critical is equivalent to a scale invariant. And maybe there are ways of formulating. So there is a way of formulating which is a bit more restrictive. We say that this describes in terms of a conformal field theory. And a conformal field theory is a field theory which by definition is scale invariant. And for those, it has been proven in one dimension. So for, conform, for, theories, for conformal field theories, which are all critical, this, is, this has been proven. 
but the meaning is to that this is scale invariant, so that the correl all possible correlation function decays on a specific way. And so, so could you could you imagine a simpler way of excluding the QNA hard hardness results for one D? Yes, because it's it's, uh, it's something that this is this is this is scale invariant. Yeah, yeah. I think it's not. Critical means scale. So there is the belief that when you have a gap and you change your parameters and you have a transition, you close the gap, and this is a second order the interesting yeah. phase transition. Then you get uh, you get an extra symmetry, which is scaling variance, and then this is why people have studied these critical theories, and they are so important in physics. So how does the, the standard model fit in this picture? Because you have a local Hamiltonian. Uh, very well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it has a local Hamiltonian. It's uh, it's in three dimensions. So so I don't know the density of state. So. But, but in principle, it may, may, may work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, thank you. <laughs>